welcome everybody. It's time once again for the next chapter with Charlie Hedges. As he explores turning the page on his life and yours. Hey, Charlie. Hi, producer Paul. You know, it's good to be with you once again. And and I'll tell you what, I am so looking forward to our show today. Our guest, Caitlin Domner, wrote a special introduction just for this episode, which I think is very, very cool. She writes this. Caitlin Domner spent three decades trying to make her life perfect, building several successful companies, publishing several books, and traveling the world for 18 months, visiting 25 countries on five continents with her husband and three kids, but discovered that no matter what she did, Caitlin couldn't outrun her demons. After studying ancient spiritual teachings, modern scientific principles, she developed a mental framework that allowed her to overcome chronic anxiety, depression, overwhelm, and secure inner peace and joy. Using a blend of metaphysics and neuroscience, her methodology, which she calls the ecstatic way, is an easy and practical way to navigate and optimize one's emotional landscape to achieve greater personal freedom, creative flow, and productivity. That's very cool. I'm um, I'm intrigued. And with that, let's bring on our guest, Caitlin Domner. Welcome to the next chapter with Charlie. Hey, Charlie. So glad to be here. I know. And we talked, and it's been at least a couple of years since we've chatted, as, as we, we talked earlier. And, and I can't believe that. And you know what I was wondering, Caitlin? How many years have we known each other? Is it like more than 15 years? Could that possibly be right 15 years yeah you found me as like straight out of college i graduated and started working at a credit union that you were consulting with and picked me out of a crowd and we hit it off and it was was so fun it was such a fun relationship because um it it happened to be a conservative a, a a pretty conservative um sort of faith tradition, you know, Christian, um, um, conservative Christian tradition. And, and while we adopted that and we were, we were fully into that, we kind of were out of the box thinking, you know, and, and I found a friend, you know, somebody else that could understand some of my, um, um, not quite aberrant, but unusual, unusual ways. And it seemed like you were right in track and, and we hit yeah. it off from then on. Mm-hmm. And I feel like we've been going on parallel philosophical journeys ever since. We just kind of touch base and say, hey, are you still feeling this way? Yeah, me too. So it's been really neat getting to watch that unfold. You know, that's really an interesting observation that there, there really are sort of parallel paths that are not prescribed. We didn't, we weren't talking about these paths. What path are you taking? What path are am I taking, only to find out, you know, especially after our, our recent conversations, that we sort of landed in very similar spots and mm-hmm. and intend to pursue sort of similar, similar paths future. So um, this is going to make for a great show, Caitlin. Um, yeah. um, I, I, I'm excited. And, and so... You know, I want to. I want to. You and I could could just could just BS for a long time, uh, which we do when we're not on the air. Um, but you know what I thought might be fun for to begin the show is your family adventures. You wrote so humbly in the introduction that you traveled the country with um, your husband and your three kids, or not travel the country, travel the world. Pardon me, travel the world. Mm. But it wasn't like, you know, your four-week destination, let's make sure we see all these places. You spent 18 months to two years in South America, Antarctica, Australia, Asia, and then a couple months in what we might call paradise in Bali. Um, Mm -hmm. You know... 
tell me about what that is. You, you know, that that's that's fascinating. No one does that. You're a gypsy. Uh, this is <laughs> this is great. Tell tell me about that adventure. Oh, there's so much to say. When, I know. I uh, forgive me. <laughs> It started with just, we'd like to take the kids out of the United States for a year, and we thought we'll just RV through Mexico, and then, like, well, maybe we'll do 60 cities, no, it was 12 cities in 12 months, and then we were looking at the map, we're like, the world is huge, so then we're like, well, let's do two years, and then it started, two years have come and gone, and we're sort of on a sabbatical, helping care for parents here in the middle, but we still have another two years of travel plan. We still haven't done India, Africa, or Europe yet. So we uh, sort of made a commitment to the kids that we'd see all seven continents. And it's so interesting because the things that we thought we were going for, for the fun and the adventure, we got that. It ended up being so much richer was the relationships that we built inside of our family. So I realized that usually families in America, they build roots out. So Kids go to school and parents go to work and everybody has their extracurricular yeah. activities and everything is separate and goes different ways. But we were like a root ball. We had to, roots had to go inward because we were constantly rolling. And there was a part of me that was, and sometimes still is worried that my kids won't have lasting friendships with other people. But you know, the closeness that we've achieved as a family has been really beautiful. Um, even when we drive each other crazy, um, but our communication has gotten much better, having to focus on things like kindness and courtesy that you can get away with not being as intentional about when you're not living with each other 24-7. Um, we've also just discovered that uh, like the kids are highly adaptable. So what I've realized is that the kids don't have sense of normal. If you ask my kids, how do people use the restroom, right? They'll give you three different toilets <laughs> that we've used around the world. Like, there's no one way to use the restroom. There's no correct food. We've eaten rubs, and we've eaten scorpions, and we've eaten uh, tarantulas. Tarantulas were actually the best. Um, crickets. We've tried pig's blood soup and pig's brain uh, food. Like, we've tasted as much as we could, and we've realized that we have preferences, but the kids are completely fearless. So if you ask your kid, my kids, what does it mean to be a domner? First word out of their mouth is crazy. <laughs> um, so they, they just, <laughs> that's what it means to be a domner is you just do life differently than everybody else does. So seeing how our family values are being translated, that they have this almost identity that they've taken on themselves. It's been a really fun to just watch them grow into that. So we've worked and we've traveled and we've done school, everything together. You know, that is so unusual and so unexpected that uh, children now, now they're sort of um, early, early to later adolescence. Is that right? Like 9 to 13 or 10 to 13, something like that? Yeah, we started when they were 5, 7, and 9, and now they're 7, 9, and 11. Oh, so yeah. they're younger than I thought. And they were able to adapt. A five-year-old could adapt to a two-year tour. That's mm -hmm. That by itself is an amazing challenge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, um, yeah so figuring out what gives you that sense of stability um, and for them recognizing it has to be an internal thing. You can't get your stability from your external environment, which, you know, is now a theme, what I do and teach. That's that, that is so, so delightful. Are the kids looking forward to going back on the road again, or are they sort of reluctant? I think there's mixed feelings. I think we put the boys back into private school. Cora had already been in an online school uh, that she loved, and so we didn't take her out of it. Um, but, yeah, I think it's been nice for them to know that they can just go to their cousin's house and play on the trampoline, and they have friends at school. And so... Mm. I think they've enjoyed it. Mm. I also think they're starting to get bored. So we'll see which one wins out. The, the enjoyment of the stability and the consistency or the boredom. Like, eh, Cora's definitely feeling itchiest, the oldest of the three, 11-year-old. She's like, I'm ready for more adventures. So we'll see how that plays out. And you and you, you wrote, did, did you write your adventure book on that process? 
weren't you going to write a sort of a kids a kids novel about oh. about yes yeah so we started a series of kids novels about a fictionalized version of our family so the first one was pursuit in paris second one coming out is in trouble into call and we have five planned but it turns out it's harder for me to get writing done when I'm on the road than I thought it would be. So it's been being published much slower than I originally anticipated. <laughs> and you also have a podcast that you that you do here with my same producer, producer Paul, and you guys have a, is it a weekly podcast yeah. or monthly or what do you do? Yeah, Paul's been interviewing us on almost a bi-weekly basis uh, since Guatemala. And yeah, it's All Over the Map Family is our podcast. And you can also <laughs> follow our adventures on Instagram with All Over the Map Family. That is great. I, you know, I, I, I didn't even know about that, so I will be following you. <laughs> now, let's, let's, we have, for the listeners, we have a very you know be be prepared to go down deep and stay down long this is um this is times you're going to need deep diving gear because i want to encourage our listeners to know that caitlin is a very deep thinker very creative and very productive but she comes from a whole different insight and and i want to go back to your introduction and and you know, not surprising. I want to talk about demons, and mm-hmm. and you know, you you talked about the demons of anxiety and depression and overwhelm, mm-hmm. um, and and with an effort to secure inner peace and joy. Can you can now you were you you had gone through, if I understand this correctly. You had been through the majority of your trip, and then in Bali, you're in paradise, and in paradise, you don't feel like paradise. Tell me like it's Mm -hmm. paradise. Tell me about that. Yeah, I realized, I mean, there was like this moment where I was sitting on this tropical beach staring at the turquoise ocean, and my kids are playing. I'm realizing I am living everyone's dream life. I was still unhappy. I was still thinking, how could I, like, what if I just declare bankruptcy and I sue for divorce and (laughs) I just run away? (laughs) And I was like, Caitlin, you've already run to the ends of the earth. Where are you going to run to? Uh, And that's when I realized, oh, maybe the problem is not my job or my husband or my house where I'm located. Maybe the problem is me. And that's what sort of led to this inner journey. Then I went and did a cacao ceremony in Bali and really felt like God spoke to me and he said, safe to shine. For whatever reason, that was the key in the lock. And what flowed through me was what I now call the ecstatic way. And I don't feel like I made it up. I feel like I just wrote it down. Like you were an amanuensis. Yeah. (laughs) I just got to be the scribe. Right, Um, right. But what I realized was that like all emotional suffering, the result of believing a lie. So when our brains are taking in information, experience facts, you can tell that something is a fact because there's no emotional charge attached to it. So might be pain, right? Physical pain is different than emotional suffering. So let's say a parent hits you. That's just a fact. There shouldn't be an emotion charge to the fact. But what happens is our brains are meaning-making machines. Like humans, we are born storytellers, and we have to create meaning from the facts that we experience. And whatever interpretation we come up with, we can tell whether or not it's in alignment with truth because of how we feel about the story. Stories are designed to evoke emotion. And so if the story that we tell ourselves is that our, our parent hit us because they hate us or they're evil or that we're not good enough or that we're unworthy of love, that creates an emotional experience of suffering. I right. feel angry. I feel hatred. I feel judgment. I feel shame. I feel inadequate. Abandonment. It's the other huh? right? And then because those become encoded as our belief system, then our brains 
which love finding evidence to support our beliefs, will sort through the 11 million data points that they receive every single second, and they will only focus on the data points and sensory information that supports the beliefs that you already hold. So your brain is not like a spotlight going and searching for things. It's like filter and a blinder system and it will only focus on the things that it expects to find this is why eyewitness testimony is historically so unreliable is you can only see what you expect to see so if you're going through life with this expectation that i'm not good enough and i'm not worthy of love you're going to always find evidence to support that belief system now we rewind back to the fact if somebody like your parent hit you, if instead the story that you told was, oh my gosh, my parent must be having a really rough day. They are trying as hard as they can and know how to, to love me as best they can. And they just have some really messed up ways of communicating that. But I'm going to have compassion on them. I'm going to have compassion on myself. And I'm going to understand that this circumstance, while it may not be pleasant and it may not be what I prefer, and it's certainly not what I would do for my own children, I can still trust this is making me stronger. This is making me better. This is making me certainly more compassionate. As a result of that trust, I can also find gratitude. I can find gratitude that my parent is loving me the best they know how, and that this is giving me an opportunity to get clear on what I want to do and how I want to show up as a human and as a parent in my own life. And what I do is you can't teach happiness. Happiness is historically elusive, but you can always find gratitude, find compassion, find trust. Yeah, and those are three be, big elements, and it will, and mm-hmm. I plan to focus on those a bit later. But but uh, but I, I, ah. I I'm interested in that because that's that's so, sort of part of your new movement of the ecstatic way of uh, embracing compassion, gratitude, and trust. You, you you know you know what what I was thinking as you were as you were talking in our day of our psychotherapeutic day of so many people in therapy the there is a there is a there is a sort of a cognitive belief and then there is something that goes much deeper than cognitive so like your example of a parent hit, parent hitting you you can cognitively understand that there's something else going on but but the translation of that from being cognitive to being emotional and accepting and not necessarily embracing but understanding it at a deeper deeper felt level how how did you get to that level because psychotherapy will identify the issues but not always will it go to how does that translate into how you how you're living now and how you make the change how did you get out of as we know, I, you know, I've wrestled with anxiety and depression, except for about the last uh, five, six years, which I've been, it, it's been really wonderful. But those are, those are like lifetime, lifetime learnings, and you seem to embrace them very quickly. Well, not very quickly, but, <laughs> you know, like no, only, only your whole, years. <laughs> what's that? I said it still took me thirty eight years yeah. to figure it out. It wasn't very fast. Yeah. Well, you're a lot faster when it took me sixty five, so <laughs> So what what do you think? What was um, it what is the magic of of being able to being able to grasp those at a whole different level? So it's interesting because I, I do study a lot of trauma work and trauma seems to be when we codify an emotional experience into our bodies. So it's like the the energy gets turned into matter. So what I have found is that very frequently, the work that I'm doing, to your point, sounds very cognitive. Usually, I'm underlying it with somatic support. So when I'm working with people in person, there's, there's breath work we can do. Um, I also, most of my coaches happen to be energy workers, so they're, they're trained 
feel into what is going on energetically and they can actually do shifting with you in real time uh, without your conscious mind even having to come online. Mm. We also do things like um, self-hypnosis. So when you're doing, so we do meditations in the morning when you wake up and the evening as you're going to sleep and your brain is automatically in a theta brainwave state, which is the same state that's taken on by Buddhist monks after years and years of practice, but you get these two magical windows when you're really open to suggestion. So we start doing some reprogramming of the subconscious uh, using meditative states during those two golden hours um, or golden windows. And um, so yeah, there's a lot of things. So, so we teach SALT is the acronym, uh, surrender, align, listen, and take action. And the S has actually been unpacked. So it's stop, just give yourself permission to stop wherever you are, whatever you're doing with your kids or in a board meeting, it doesn't matter. Just give yourself permission to say, you know what? I just need a minute. So stopping. And then the second one is soothe. So a lot of people forget that they're animals first <laughs> and then spiritual creatures second. So soothing and regulating your nervous system. So taking care of your body with breath, with rest, with hydration, with nutrition, um, and with pleasure. So having those little tools in your toolkit that you can just bring your nervous system back, soothe it, uh, regulate it, um, bring bring your brain from your lower hemisphere back into your upper hemisphere, and then you can do the work of surrender, which the, the mantra that we use is, um, I surrender, release what I think should be, receive the gift of what is here now. So just letting go of the illusion of control is and, and trusting everything is always working out for you. Um, and that's the alignment step, that trust that this is working out. If I can't see why, I'm not at the end of my story. Yeah. And so that that's what allows people, you do, to your point, you have to do, you have to take care of the physical self in order to access the mental self. Yeah, we, we, you know, there's a, do we, there's a question I've read up frequently. Do we, um, does thinking lead to doing or does doing lead to thinking? And I happen to be falling <laughs> more into the latter camp that you do it. Mm -hmm. And then the feelings, you know, it begins with, you, you, you know, there's an interplay going on all the time. It's not just a, a black and white cut and dried um but but actions actions do determine the content of our character mm -hmm. every decision you make is being coded literally into your genetics uh it's really fun to study how decisions and the habits uh that we make on a daily basis are affecting us physically no oh. You, you, you know, that's why I'm such a ritual oriented person. I have I have morning yeah. rituals and evening rituals that um, are rarely do I not do my rituals. And were it not for my rituals, you know, I just would be kind of going along with the day and, and frustrated or thinking this way. It sort of puts me in a different state of mind. So I I concur. One of the things that I was thinking about in this whole process of discovery, you have created yet again another company. You know, I, I don't know how many companies you have, but um, you've created another company that you have you have named the Ecstatic Way, and there's some unique there's some unique um, it's a unique process and. I'd like you to sort of sort of clue us in on what what Caitlin Domner's and your team, because you have a team, the Caitlin wow. Domner team, the ecstatic way. What is what is what is that about the ecstatic way? What what is that about? Mm. Yeah, so I'll start with the word ecstatic. So a lot of people associate ecstatic with state of bliss. But it originally started as a state of self transcendence. So the etymology of the word is ek, so out of, stasis, your ordinary, and the ancients used it as 
out of your mind. And usually it happened when you went you interacted with a god. And and people all over the world in every single religion and culture have experiences of this out of your mindness when you interact with the divine. And that concept of getting people out of their mind out of their ego, out of their self as they currently perceive their self and connecting with something that is higher. And I've gotten, I'm okay, <laughs> I'm less and less concerned with titles of whatever we call that thing that is higher. But that connection, that self-transcendence, it does come with a state of bliss very frequently. In my opinion, it's the connection that's the point the bliss is just a happy byproduct of the state of connectedness. And so everything that we do in our company starts with the framework of how is this feeding my soul? So if you're an entrepreneur, how is the business that I'm building driving my soul's evolution? How is every challenge that I'm facing helping me to become my best and highest self? Same thing with life, right? So how is my marriage forcing me to become a better human? How is my parenting feeding my soul? And really looking through everything at the lens of either growth or pleasure, and we do a lot with masculine and feminine energies. Masculine is the growth, the yang, the driving, the force energy, where it's it's changing what is to the thing that we want to create, whereas the feminine, the yin side, is appreciating what is here and now. It's the pleasure principle. So when I'm working with my clients, I'm like, everything that you're doing in your life should either be growing, expanding your capacity, pleasure, or you should be enjoying it. Pleasure is our route to growth. And um, just kind of as a side note, Charlie, we didn't even get to talk about this, but I feel like so much of world history and the major religions have had an ascetic approach to God. How do we sublimate the desires? How do we go out into the desert? How do we eliminate pleasure from our life? Flailing, flailing want, ourselves with whips. How do we and, eat our bodies? Yes. Right? And what I'm now interested in is, is what's the aesthetic way? What is the path of love and joy and beauty and pleasure? How does that connect us to God? Um, so that's, I kind of am seeing it as the feminine approach to God uses pleasure as the connection point for ecstatic union with the divine. You know, in the, um, the, you know, I'm Episcopalian and in our Eucharist, the very first line of the Eucharist, I often say it's divided by a semicolon. And I often, often say we need to just stop and think because it says, um, um, Lord God, in your divine love, not divine wisdom, in your divine love, you made us for yourself. And I said, mm -hmm. we need to just stop and ponder on that. That mm -hmm. God, God not only desires to give love, but God desires to receive love. If God is love, it is a receiving and a giving. And God takes such pleasure in the mm -hmm. receiving of our love. And then I must, as an aside, I'm going to do a little rabbit trail here. I agree with you in the name of the divine, because when I mention God, almost every single listener understands what God is, but in their own box. And it's completely, and, mm -hmm. and, it, and it's like, it's like a hundred thousand different boxes. And so yeah. we need to find a new language. I, I think that, I think the whole thing of spirituality, Christianity, Islam, Hindu, we need to find a new language that we can that we can use together for you know I use the word divinity and the holy quite a bit those are mine mm -hmm. but but uh, because because God is you know really the way is defined is not not necessarily a very pleasant entity you know, are frequently an unpleasant got entity. Some bad branding over the last three thousand years. <laughs> got some got bad branding. Problem. 
Yeah, I, you, you know, I, I really want to talk. We're, you know, the focus, what, what, what drove me to invite you to do a podcast is what you're calling the dance between the masculine and feminine energies. And, and I think our listeners are going to get a ton out of that. But I, there are just a couple of notes that I took that, um, that, that really sort of, sort of turned me on to your, concept of his static way and and i'll mention a couple of things that i've written down and that was your the the mission your 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 goal your objective is to end emotional suffering that's um mm-hmm. that's a big deal caitlin domner <laughs> well i brought it down a little bit i said for one billion people so that's only one eighth of the planet but i <laughs> Once we get that ball rolling, then the rest can kind of spread like wildfire. <laughs> yeah, I love that. But I think you're on to something, and, and we'll talk more about that. And then there's another thing. You know, I'm just I'm just highlighting things that I think were really insightful. And I like this line you wrote somewhere. Um, Don't wait to be seen. Instead, focus on shining. Do you know? How, do you know how cool of a statement that is? You know, you're not waiting, you, you know, just kind of wandering aimlessly, hoping people will see you and recognize you and acknowledge you and respect you. Instead, focus on the light. Let your light shine. And then you're going to you're, you're going to be seen. But that's not the objective. The objective is not to be seen. The objective is to shine. Did I did I catch your statement well? Yeah, yeah. So that was that was that dichotomy of I've seen so many quote spiritual people who are exclusively in that feminine yin energy, but it's almost like shadow version of what it's intended to be. They're not harmonizing with the masculine, and they're very passive, and they're just waiting for everything to happen to them and and that idea of just i just want to be seen well then go out there and start shining so yeah it was sort of my uh kick in the pants to my woo woo community yeah <laughs> was where yeah. that that started <laughs> and you know what that is you know you, you know you know how i define that define that for me personally is kindness I think is for me is the 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 greatest light for shining is to mm. be kind because we are just not frequently a kind society and um, and acceptance of things that I don't agree on is that I mm. love paradox ambiguity and sort of holding two opposite truths at the same time my capability of mm-hmm. doing that that allows me to shine to other people because i can be accepting and loving and kind to other people because i'm not judging them i'm not i'm not trying to make them another version of me i want to mm-hmm. enjoy the version of them mm-hmm. Yeah, it's so funny. I was just reading about paradox on Brene Brown. Oh, yeah. And uh, she quotes Carl Jung. She says, the paradox is one of our most valuable spiritual possessions. Only the paradox comes anywhere near comprehending the fullness of life. And really love that because I think you're right. You can't, a lot of people try to homogenize and, and, in the goal for us to be united they become uniform and i'm like no i'm not interested in a gray dow i'm interested in a stark white and a stark black dow <laughs> they need the balance uh and so it for me it's not it's, it's harmony it's how do you have two completely different resonances and frequencies and bring them together in a way that both of them are more beautiful and more powerful because they're playing at the same time. That is um, that is a brilliant comment. I you, you no know, wonder I like talking to you so much because uh, <laughs> because 
I'm 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 hung up on wires right now. I mean, I know. I mean, I'm literally hung up on wires ah. around my chair, <laughs> and and I'm kind of sitting cockeyed trying to adjust to the wires. So, what I want to do now is I want to talk about what I want to talk about, and I want to talk about this mm-hmm. dance with the masculine and feminine energies, and I think that's where we'll. We'll focus the second half of our show. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a... Oh, my goodness, look what time it is. We're going to take a break, and we're going to get into the podcast. This is going to be... Folks, this is going to be a longer podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so let's take a break, Producer Paul. Hi there, you're listening to Charlie Hedges on the next chapter with Charlie, and we are in a delightfully enlightening conversation with uh, short version Caitlin Co- Domner and longer version Caitlin Cogan Domner, which is what I've known her for 15 years as. And Caitlin writes these, I'm not a big Facebook person. But every now and then I look on Facebook, and lo and behold, there's a little brief, really intriguing essay by Caitlin, and she wrote on the dance of the masculine and feminine energies, and I just replied, we've got to do a show on this. So so maybe if you start out by, why don't you, you know, I'll let you, you just sort of do a dance to teach us to dance Mm -hmm. with what the masculine and feminine energies are all about because they're absolutely critical. Yeah, this is one of my favorite topics and it it really is the foundation of a lot of the work that I do. So I think a lot of people, first confusion that most people have is male versus female, which are bodies, genders, versus masculine and feminine, which are energies and universal so it every single body whether the body is male or female needs to find their unique dance with the masculine and the feminine energies and these masculine and feminine energies these are ancient concepts and principles from our earliest uh, days and articulated my favorite image is the symbol of the Tao, which is that yin and the yang black and the white, and they're interchanged with each other because everybody recognizes that it's not an either-or sort of scenario. So, and, 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 and I must say, if you look at the, the logo that is frequently used between the yin and the yang, th- there there is no gray area. There is the black yang and the white yin. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a little... Um, a little kind of dance in between but they are still stark that they're both they're both unique and both important but there's not a gray no because if you have like it's the same there's no friction and the friction is what causes the spark the spark is the generative force of the entire universe it is always male and female that creates life And that is a metaphor for, I believe, the masculine and the feminine energies that are at play on a universal scale. And so there does need to be friction. They do need to be polarized. They do need to be separate. But that doesn't mean that you can't dance between them. And so usually when I'm I'm explaining this, I explain as, as a female, I tend to be feminine. That is my inherent state. I love to be in a state of relaxation and play and flow. I can do masculine. So I step into my masculine when I'm in a strategic business coach or I'm reverse engineering a plan or I'm just getting shit done. Like that energy is so powerful. Um, and I've talked a lot about the, the 12 feminine archetypes. And there are some feminine archetypes that are very masculine energy. The warrior and the queen, for example, mm-hmm. have so much yang energy in them. They are the fighters. They are the builders. They are the conquerors, right? 
So it's really important to recognize that you can be deeply feminine and still step into your masculine, do what needs to be done, and then come back to the flow state. Alternatively, I've spoken to some of my male counterparts and they're like, no, I be masculine. Like I show up as the container and holding space um, and providing structure so that I can do feminine. I can facilitate connection and collaboration and and all of those beautiful uh, creativity, like all of those beautiful yin energies, they, they are masculine container. And it's interesting because I view masculine and feminine energy as almost like Rush, Russian nesting dolls. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. the highest level, I think that the reason uh, we ended up choosing masculine pronouns to describe the divine was because all of us are in a feminine relationship to that divine source. The source is the productor and the provider and the initiator and the active force that creates everything. We, the created, get to be the receivers. We get to be the the passive agents in that relationship. So my husband gets to be feminine in relationship to the divine, but he gets to be masculine in the relationship to me and our children. So the masculine is the container. It is the structure. It is the, the, the form. And then the feminine is the content. It is the flow. It is the what inside of the, the, the vessel. And so I to be feminine in relationship to my husband, I get to be masculine for my children. I am the mother, but the mother is another like masculine energy archetype because that care, that nurture, that proactive protection, that those are all masculine qualities, right? The mother needs to be selfless, but ironically, selflessness is not a feminine trait. <laughs> selfishness is the feminine trait where you get to just relax like the child is the ultimate feminine they're they're not expected to be contributors they're not expected to be providers they're not expected to be protectors like they they get to simply receive and be taken care of and it's beautiful when it's held well inside of the container of parenting held inside of the container of authority figures held inside the ultimate container of the divine presence in the universe it stops being effective when children become adults and they should be starting to take on masculine uh, relationships they should start contributing to their community they should be protecting and providing for those under them and they're not they're not stepping up on their nesting doll and bringing mentees or people underneath them um, or, or creating children, very literally. Um, and so we're seeing this almost where I was getting into the kind of the, the shadow yin, the toxic femininity of, of people who don't want to step into their masculine and give back. They're just constantly receiving, 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 but it's like only trying to inhale you need to inhale and exhale that there is this the heart cannot just pull blood in it has to pump blood out there has to be give and take in order for it to be a natural system nature nature doesn't do one-sided anything you you know let's do um um very briefly you wrote and i'm looking at the the post that you wrote and I think it might be helpful for our listeners to do just a light definition of the feminine energy and the masculine energy, the yin and the yang. Yeah. And, and here's here are the words that you described, the feminine energy, the yin. It is darkness, spiritual, mystery, receiving, appreciating, flow. And the yang or the masculine is light, not in not in weight, but in brightness, in shiny light. Mm-hmm. It's tangible. It's manifested. It's active. It's providing. It's 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 changing, and and it's force. Um, one of the things you know, I, you know what I'm realizing is that ooh, I'm stuck, Caitlin. You know, 
we need to talk about this. We need to make a special show on this where we don't talk about anything else. Do you have time to do another show sometime? Yeah, let's do it. Um, and, and, and y- you know, I want to talk about the dance. I want to talk about flow. I mean, flow is so critical that, that you know, that comes from the feminine energy. And all of us creatives are longing to be into flow. We're longing to be in that deep state where nothing exists, where where somebody, I, I heard a writer just uh, a couple days ago tell me that when you're writing well, it's like butter coming out of your pen. And I think we might make this show, we might leave this show to an, as an introduction, and then we'll come and we will just focus primarily on this dance because... I can see us going another half hour or more on that, don't you? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Okay, so I hate to do this to everybody, but we are... This is the keys to the dance. Yeah, this is, we are going to rest for the day. This is a tease to come into the dance, and we will do that dance with some kind of fun and some kind of total enjoyment. So... Caitlin, you remain one of my very favorite people on this planet. You really do. And mm, right back at it, Charlie. Oh, thank you. And I'm so honored that you were able to spend quality time with me. So thank you for being my guest today. And let's look forward to a time like next week. So, but we'll talk about it in a break and we'll work on about it and figure that out. Okay. That's great. All right. I want to thank all our listeners for tuning in to the next chapter with Charlie. And until next, this is Charlie Hedges signing off. Bye for now.